Hello everyone, it is Thursday, I'm Ricky, this is Newsround, we're live on CBBC, coming up in the next few minutes, how to develop your very own video game, and a ghostly shipwreck washes up in Canada. But first, to Northern Ireland, where there's going to be a government up and running once again. For the past two years, there hasn't been a government in Belfast because the political parties there couldn't agree to work together. The Northern Ireland Assembly is responsible for making decisions on how things like hospitals, schools and transport are run. Lots of people have welcomed the news and the deal to bring back the government is expected to be approved by the UK Parliament in Westminster later today. Or to find out more about what's happening in Northern Ireland, you can head to the Newsround website. Next, while the weather's become milder, it's not quite spring yet, but it is time to answer one of your big questions. Now, we'll have to wait a few more months for them to emerge, but have you ever wondered how butterflies get their beautiful patterns? Hi, my name is Kerry, and I am a zoo ranger here at Chester Zoo. <laughs> of species of butterflies found around the world and they come in all sorts of different colours and patterns. Their patterns are created by two different ways. So first of all, they have something called melanin. Now melanin is a compound that's inside your own bodies as well and that's what gives you a nice tan or some freckles on your face in the summertime. And in our butterflies, it gives them their brown and yellow patterns but they have something else. So you have probably seen some really brightly coloured butterflies in your time. And those bright colours don't come from melanin. Butterflies have got loads of tiny scales on their wings. And what happens is as the light shines through those scales, it bounces around, it reflects off all the surfaces and it creates different colours. So if you've ever been blowing bubbles out in the garden, you'll see that sometimes the bubbles can shine different colours in the sunlight. And that's exactly what's happening in the butterfly wings. So now you know. Next, from delicate butterflies to something a little more sturdy, but still incredibly cute, let me show you this young calf and her mum Josie. The rare black rhino is one of the most endangered species in the world. The calf's birth is great news for conservationists and the family has been bonding in their own private den before the weather warms up and they can move into outdoor habitats. Scientists plan to study their behaviour to help preserve black rhinos in the wild. Now, have you ever fancied creating your own video game? Then keep watching for a special how-to. There's a couple of things you're probably going to th want to think about. Having an inspiring main character or protagonist, maybe an unexpected plot twist, and of course, lots of fun problems to solve. Well, as part of National Storytelling Week, Emma Louise met a gaming expert who gave pupils a special lesson to help them develop their ideas for new games. Let's see how they got on. Whether it's Minecraft, Mario Kart or Roblox, the makers of our favourite games have had to create characters, themes and even entire universes for our enjoyment. But where do the experts start when designing a game? I've come to meet Gabrielle, who's an author and a video game designer. She's helping these guys come up with ideas for new games. Number one, the characters. I think character is a good place to start. So thinking of a really interesting character, maybe that you don't particularly see in other types of games and thinking about what are their goals, what do they want to achieve and what's so interesting about them that's going to make them a really exciting character to play. Who's the protagonist? The protagonist, we haven't made a name for it yet, but he's, um, a cent he's like a half centaur. So your game name is Fruitalicious. Yeah. Our protagonist is Appalachia. Yeah. The objective is to get vitamin fruit points. Yeah. yeah. But we might make a villain as well. Oh, who will the yeah. villain be? The villain will be the pomegranate. Level two, the world. Let's let Vicky Baker from the National Literacy Trust explain more. What ingredients do you need in a good story? So I think there are three areas to think about. People, place and problem. And I think place is one of the most exciting things because you get to create a whole new world that your audience can explore and get lost in. And what about the worlds? What world does Appalachia live in? Fruits and vegetables world. Okay. 
And what does it look like? Well, there's just going to be green everywhere and the environment's going to be really healthy. Oh, there's multiple worlds. It's a fantasy game, so like there's jungles and seas for you to explore. We're celebrating National Storytelling Week by dreaming up new worlds. So whether that's through video games, books, graphic novels, comics, and really all it takes is your imagination. Level three, the storyline. A game needs a good storyline because if it does not have a good storyline, then the game will be too fast and repetitive and then it'll get boring really fast. Taking part in a story and actually taking that story in different directions is really exciting to end up with different kind of conclusions depending on decisions your character makes. So there you have it. Gaming is a whole lot more than just a screen and a few buttons on a controller. It can be the starting point for players to explore or create entire new worlds. And I, for one, can't wait to play through Delicious one day. Nice one. Thanks for that, Emma Louise. Now, this almost sounds like the start of a great storyline. A ghostly shipwreck has appeared on a beach in Canada. Residents in Cape Ray are trying to work out the mystery of a ghostly shipwreck that has washed up on the island of Newfoundland. So far, their best guess is that a hurricane brought the vessel into shallow waters. It's 24 metres long, that's nearly as long as a swimming pool, and is made of wooden planks and copper nails that were commonly used in the 1800s, suggesting it could be very old indeed. I wonder if there's any treasure on board. Now, over on the Newsroom website this week, you've been telling us what you think about the first human to have a computer chip implanted in their brain by the firm Neuralink. Now, tech billionaire Elon Musk, who owns the company, said the chip can be recharged wirelessly and is designed to let people control their phones or computers using only the power of their mind. Incredible stuff. He also said he hoped it could be used to cure conditions like depression and autism. Well, here's what you guys had to say about it. Nyack Star uh, was straight in there saying, I don't think this is a good idea. I think I'm with you on that one. A T Level 23 has a different take. They said, it's amazing how far technology has come. And our next user said, I'm autistic, but I do not want to change myself as I'm fine. And people don't need a chip to change their personality. Thanks, guys, for sending in those comments. Really interesting stuff. OK, uh, also on the Newsround website, you can find loads of other great things, including news of NASA's Perseverance rover that has found some evidence supporting the theory lakes once existed on Mars. The rover's main job is to find signs of life and the presence of lakes increases the chance there may have been tiny life forms in the water. OK, well, do join us tomorrow for all the latest news, including our favourite stories of the week in Strange. Don't miss it. Until then, you can head online to the Newsround website to catch up with all of today's top stories. I'll see you very soon. Have a lovely day. Bye bye.